gun somewhere was standing right behind me. I started to turn. Then I heard something come down over me. I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound and blood running wildly down my arm. A knife. I tried to grab the arm. I, I couldn't reach it. The knife was coming down again. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. And this is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode with Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans. We call it The Case of the Bloodstained Pearl. Time, why not bring along an axe? Close the door quickly. Uh, sit quickly, man. Where's the key? Key? I want you to lock the door. Now, look, I Papa. said I want you to lock the door, Mr. Shane. Well, let's just snap the double lock for now, huh? And hope for the best. Hey, hey, where are you going? I want to look down the street. I'm sure they followed me. A crafty, scheming lot, I'll tell you that. Hey, who are you talking about, Pop? My friends, that's who. My dear, faithful friends. Faithful friends. They boil me in oil and skin me alive. Cut me to ribbons to find out the hiding. Hey, look, you better slow down. You're going to burn out a berry. Scallions, scallywags, cutthroats, licks, fiddles. And chicken inspectors. What are these friends of yours trying to find? None of your business. You just keep that nose of yours out of our fears. Hey, me. hey, hey, remember, you came to me. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's... Oh, it's just it's all so infuriating. Makes my blood boil, I swear it does. Three dear friends. For six years, we've shared the same little houseboat. Same skimpy fare. We've watched 2,000 sunsets. Yeah. We've talked 10,000 hours of the night away. And now, <clears throat> Mr. Shane, what are your rates for guarding a man's life and possessions? I kind of think I might be a little too rich for your blood, old timer. Oh, a little too rich for my blood. Well, now, you do indeed. Well, 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 Mr. Shane. Look, I suppose I... you've come to that remarkable decision just by looking at now, me. Now, just this tattered a... coat, these patched pants, cardboard mushrooms. I... Too rich for my blood, huh? Let's shed a tear for me, poor old man Pete. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, feelings but I... Feelings? Why the feelings? I come here on business. My life's in peril, my possessions in jeopardy. Despite your outrageous rates, I'll pay out of my meager safe. And just what are these possessions you want me to protect? Wait, wait. Hey, hey, leave those window shades alone. It's dark enough as it is in here. Stop it, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, Mr. Shane, now this is what I want you to protect. Yeah? The contents of this little leather bag. What? Yes, here's what this pitiful old man wants you to protect. Yes, Mr. Shane, yes. This is what they killed me for. In the palm of my hand, I hold three pearls worth a million dollars. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It had started like any other day. A widow named Mrs. Coppolis had hired me to track down one of her boarders who'd run away with her copper samovar. And, I fear, the good widow's heart. A guy had called to ask my rates for getting divorce evidence against his blonde wife. And then an old man named Peters came in. The kind of old guy you might see in Jackson Square, sleeping on the grass with a newspaper over his face. Only this old man had a million dollars worth of the biggest pearls I'd ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> well, how do you like them, Mr. Shane? Well, you, you could use them for snowballs, Mr. <laughs> Peters. Where'd you get them? I found them three weeks ago, a little cove along the Mississippi. Not so many years ago, this part of the river was one of the favorite haunts of pirates, like Rafit. This might have been part of his treasure. Lost in the sea, washed up by the tides. Yeah. yeah. Give him back to me. Give him here. Give him here. You've held him long enough. Yeah, they're all yours, Pop. Hey, did you ever have him appraised by a jeweler? I wouldn't trust him out of my sight. Even my own friends would kill me for well, him. How do you know they're worth a million bucks? I've gone to the library. I looked up pearls in all encyclopedias. I've compared them with the descriptions of the very finest. There is no comparison. <laughs> Mine are the most beautiful pearls of them all. And they take them from me. Imagine that, my own friends. Now, if you were smart, you'd sell them no good jewelry and forget them. Never. I'll never sell them. What could anyone give me half so beautiful as these pearls themselves? Yeah, I bet you a million dollars all stacked up real neat is kind of beautiful. 
Besides, looking in an encyclopedia, what's that? Hmm? For all you know, these pearls came out of a popcorn box, and you're all upset about nothing. Oh, you think so? You think so, eh? Nothing. Well, all right. Let's go to a jeweler. I saw one down the street. Oh, yeah, Mr. Forrest. Mind you, I won't sell them, no matter what the price. But let him look at them, Mr. Shane. Let him tell you what they're worth. Well, Mr. Forrester? Well, Go what? on, tell us, Mr. Shane, what they were. He thinks they might have come out of a, a what was it, a, a popcorn box. Tell him, go on, go on, tell him. I've never seen anything like them. Mm-hmm. They're priceless. Ah, you hear, Mr. Shane, you hear, you hear? Now, give them back to me. Give me here, give me here. Yes, of course. My beautiful little ladies. Now, Mr. Shane knows your worth, yes? Now, he won't mock you anymore. Well, what would you say they were worth, Mr. Forrester? Well, I wouldn't even try to give you an estimate, Mr. Shane. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forrester. Come on, Pop. Back to my office. Okay, Pop, have a seat. Uh, uh, now you'll take me seriously, Mr. Shane. These people who you think are trying to take the pearls I from you. I don't me. think. I know. They give me for Yeah, them. yeah. All right. You say you live with them on a houseboat, huh? Yeah. Off Pier 22 on River Highway. And did you tell them about the pearls? No, of course not. But I know they're spying on me continually. Now, and wait. And Excuse me. Uh, all right. Yeah? Mr. Shane, this is fast, on the Judah. Yeah. I thought I'd better call you as soon as you got back to your office. Why? Is the old man still with you? Yeah. Then don't let on who's talking to you. What's that? I didn't want to break his heart. I could see what the pearls meant to him, and as long as he never tries to sell them, well, why should we hurt him? You mean... They're paste, Mr. Sheen. Nothing but paste. At the very most, they are worth five dollars. Well, how do you like that? Shane, I wish you'd hurry. I don't have all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Shane, now we can talk business. I've already gotten a business. But go on, Mr. Peters. So old man Peters hired me to protect his five dollars worth of imitation pearls. I overcame the real Shane long enough to tell him he could pay me at the end of the month, by which time I was sure he'd be out of my hair. He left the office and I forgot about it. Then one night he caught me in one of my less happy moods. The office rent was two weeks overdue. Three of my checks had bounced. I was stretched out on my couch feeling jollier than words can say and the phone started ringing. Yeah. It's me again, Peters. Look, Peters, I wish you'd stop calling me. What kind of a detective are you anyhow? Threatening the phone day and night and you wish I'd stop calling. Oh, what is it now? I know who's been following me. I saw the day for the Time. Look, this is not good. It's bad for you and it's bad for me. You you come up to my office. I'm going to break it to you, gently. Well, break what to me? You just come on up, Pop. But don't you want to hear who was following You'll tell me when you get here. We'll trade little secrets. Okay, Pop, okay. Do you always have to knock like that? Look, if you break the glass, you're going to have to hock all your pearls to pay for it. Come on in. And... Shane. Hey. I... Hey, hey, Pop, I... what's wrong? Uh... Uh... Old man Peters was dead before he hit the floor. I don't know how he ever lived to reach my office. There were four bullet holes in his back. As he fell, his left arm flung out wildly. His left fingers doubled into a fist. I bent down to see what was in that fist. It was his most priceless possession, a bag of phony pearls. Before calling the cops, I put the pearls in my pocket because now I was going to make it my business to find out who'd killed the old man. After the cops finished questioning me, I really felt beat. I went home to my hotel room and arranged my weary bones around the lumps in the mattress and drifted off to sleep. Then I had to drift right back again. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, oh, Tompkins. Hey, watch me down at the office building. Oh, oh, yeah. I thought I'd better call you. Well, what happened? Uh, somebody broke into your office a while ago. Huh? Well, when was this? Well, it must have been between my rounds. I heard something. I came and looked. Everything sure was torn to pieces. Fine, fine. I hope they didn't get anything of value, Mr. Shane. No. No, that's what makes it so wonderful to be poor. Good night. I hung up and started going back to sleep. Just before I made it, I suddenly started thinking about the little bag of phony pearls that was right now in the rear pocket of the pants hanging over my dresser. 
All of a sudden, I wasn't nearly as sleepy as I thought. I reached my cigarettes under my pillow, and then I heard the tiniest sound. Someone was trying to fit a key into my door. The tiny grating sound continued. A couple seconds more, and the door would open. I started for my gun on the dresser. I heard the lock snap back. I ran for the dresser. Oh! Oh, Doc, I stumbled over a chair. I heard a quick move in the hall. I grabbed the gun and raced to the door. The hall was empty. Nothing but closed doors with numbers on it. The only sound was a guy in one of the rooms whimpering in his sleep. A nice, peaceful scene. Five seconds ago, I'd been close enough to death to smell it. Who had it been? Who had old man Peter's been afraid of? That was an easy one. His three pals on the houseboat. I remember how I'd laughed to myself when he told me they'd kill him for the pearls. Funny thing, I wasn't laughing anymore. I had the pearls now. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It all started when a little old guy named Peters came to my office with a wild story of three pearls worth a million dollars. Forrester, a jeweler, said they were worth five bucks at the outside. Yeah, they were paste. Anyhow, somebody thought enough of the pearls to kill the old man. Now I had them, and somebody was trying to kill me. The next morning when I went down to my battered old office, I found a telegram among the ruins. Would like to see you this evening regarding the death of our friend George Peters. And there was an address. It was dark by the time we got there. The cab had worn out three maps and his smiling disposition. Five miles out of town, right in the middle of nothing. A rotting wooden pier sticking into the water maybe 20 feet. At the end of it, a battered old tug. That'll be 275. Okay, here you are. I'm sure sorry I dragged you out this far. You ain't half so sorry as I am, friend. Oh, wait for me, will you? I'll be right back. Drop dead. Uh, hey, hey, wait. Hey. Great. In the darkness, the lights of New Orleans seemed a thousand miles away. I started down the wooden pier. There were lights somewhere on the tug. There didn't seem to be anything living around here, except the mosquitoes. I hopped onto the tug and started looking for somebody. And I heard someone singing. I followed the sound. Found a stairway leading down into the hold of the ship. The old guys were sitting on orange crates near a big pot-bellied coal stove. The one who was singing looked like Moses must have looked. Complete with a flaming red beard. Thank you, Brown. Just hearing it makes me feel a little better. Uh, <clears throat> who are you? What do you want? I'm Michael Shane. Shane. Listen, what? Shane. Brown? Mm. Yeah. Mr. Brown was just singing Paul Mr. Peter's favorite song. Old George never got tired of hearing it. What can we do for you, Mr. Shane? I got a wire asking me to come down here. I sent the wire, Mr. Shane. Hmm, well, where'd you come? Oh. My niece, Mr. Shane. Why'd you send for him, Eve? To hear his side of it. His side of it. Mr. Peters died in your office, according to the papers, Mr. Shane. Well, that's right, Eve. The papers also say they can't seem to find a motive for the crime. He wasn't robbed. They say they found his wallet and his wallet. That's all they found. Oh, is there something else to find, Mr. Bryant? See, Eve, you see? Yeah. I think you better go, Mr. Shane. Yeah, but I've got some questions to ask, too. Last it's night, somebody... A long, long trail of... Hey, will you tell this guy to shut up? Get out, Mr. Shane. Get out of my sight. I can take a hint as well as the next guy. Besides, there was something in old Brown's eyes when he turned on me. Or maybe it was the crazy red beard. Anyhow, all of a sudden, I wanted to be in the open air again. With the cab gone, there was nothing between me and New Orleans but a long, long trail of winding, like the man said. I started hiking down the road. Must have walked two miles before I came to the gas station. It was all locked up for the night, but there was a phone booth outside. I called for a cab. And then as I hung up, I'd have sworn somebody was standing right behind me. 
I started to turn. I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound, a knife. I, I tried to grab the arm, and instead my fingers closed around the blade. I felt the blade cutting into the flesh. There wasn't any pain, just a warm wetness. I, I couldn't reach the knife. I, I found his wrist with my teeth. I bit down hard. Oh, hard. Ah. The knife hit the ground. And I grabbed for the guy. My fingers closed around a handful of hair. He, he tore himself free, ah. running off down the road. And I just flopped down on the ground. After a while, I lit my cigarette lighter to take inventory of the wreckage. I was some mess. One hand looked like second-quality hamburger. The other hand was okay. It still held a fistful of hair. Red hair. Yeah, I'd just given Mr. Brown's beard a trim. The hard way. The cab showed up about an hour later. Instead of going to the city, I headed back to Pier 22. I was just groggy enough and mad enough to want the rest of that red beard. I marched down the gangway again. This time, there was only Eve putting a coffee pot on the stove. She heard me and she turned. What? Mr. Shane. Where is he? I'm going to kill him. Where is he? You heard. Look at you. Oh, never mind. Now, just tell me where I can get my hands on that bearded old boy. You've got to let me help you now. Here, sit down, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, better. Only for a minute, though. Let me get your coat off now. Good heavens, Mr. Shane, just look at you. Yeah, nice old man you are, Mr. Brown. Hey, hey, easy with the coat. Here. Oh. He'll take the arm right with you. Well, Mr. Brown didn't. Yeah, he sure did. I've got half his red beard to prove it. I was afraid something like this was going to happen. I don't know what to say. You better say it with mercurochrome and bandages. Yeah. I didn't think it was this bad myself. There. I think that'll hold you till you can get to a doctor. Yeah, yeah. Regular Florence Nightingale, aren't you? I mean, I bet you Florence never wore blue jeans and a green sweater. You still look pretty weak, Mr. Sheen. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Yeah, good idea. Of course, I like my mama's way better. Huh? But when I got hurt, she used to kiss it better. I'll get the coffee. I was talking about mama. How much sugar? You really got a one-track mind, Eve. Two lumps. Well, as long as you don't want to discuss mama, let's get back to old man Brown. Where is he now? I don't know. I haven't seen him since you left. Here's your coffee. Thanks. It's good and hot. You know, I'm glad you're not in on this. In on what? This whole business, Peters, Pearls, Brown. I don't understand you. Oh, of course you don't understand. It takes a particular kind of woman to understand. Now, I've been in this racket so long, I can spot a wrong dame like that. That's remarkable. Oh, nothing remarkable about it, Eve. They'll, they'll say something or look at you in a certain way. You get to know you. You get to feel. Uh, drink your coffee. It's getting cold, Mr. Shane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, everything they do, the perfume they wear, the way they dress, everything's a promise. You fall for the promise and end up in the gutter. I understand people like that, honey. But you don't understand people like Mr. Brown, do you, Mr. Shane? <laughs> What's that understand? A bag of pearls explains Mr. everything. Mr. Brown with his ferocious red beard. You know what he was? Milkman in Chicago. Yeah, he should have stayed there. Trapped in a dull, monotonous job. Year after year. Finally pensioned off so he could crawl into a corner and die. Yeah, I... My uncle and poor Mr. Peters, they're like that, too. Wasting the last precious years. But always dreaming of escape. He's... I didn't hear him. Now escaping his old house boot on the Mississippi. Pulled every penny they had to buy. It was worth it. Look, I... I don't feel Can't so good. Can't imagine how happy these three old men were. Can't imagine how fond they became of each other. Yeah. Something wrong, Mr. Shane? Sick. Stomach. What? Your faith in me was a little premature, Mr. Shane. I poisoned your coffee. I started for the gangway, and then the gangway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two gangways, and then there were four, and then there were gangways everywhere. I, I hung on to all the railings. Tried climbing all the stairs, and then barring my way was Eve's uncle, Mr. Johnson. Only it was a whole row of Mr. Johnsons, and they were all holding ancient guns. I remember rushing past, rushing through the cold air. I remember falling to my knees just as I heard all the ancient guns go off. 
Last thing I saw in all the world were the headlights of the taxi cab I'd told to wait. My last thought was how funny. Uh, most taxi cabs had only two headlights, but this one had half a million. Looks like he's coming out of it, Doc. Yes, he's a lucky boy. Shane, you must have cornered the market on four-leaf clovers. You had enough poison in you to... Take it easy, Mr. Shane. You're going to be all right. There was this Eve. Eve. Talk Eve, double-crossing dame. Oh! The cab driver who brought you here gave us the address. Now, look, you go to sleep, kiddo. I'll pick him up. Oh, oh, wait for me. Uh, Hand me my pants, Doc. Mr. Shane, I absolutely won't be responsible for what happened. Hand me my pants, I... After what I've taken from those three, I wouldn't miss a payoff if it took my last corpus. But, Mr. Shane... Will you hand me my pants and... Inspector... Yeah? Since I'm the guy that ran through the meat grinder, will you let me finish it off my way? Well, what do you mean, Shane? On the way out to the house, board, I want to pick up a jeweler named Forrester. So we picked up Forrester. The poor guy was so scared to hear us pounding on his door at two in the morning, I thought he'd never live to make the houseboat. It was almost three when we got there, but Eve and Brown and Johnson were still up, sitting around the red-hot coal stove like they'd been expecting us right along. Eve jumped up as we clattered down the gangway. Mr. Shane, Mike, you're all right. Yeah, yeah, that coffee, it was better than tonic. You ought to bottle it, Eve. You really have something there. Mr. Brown, your beard doesn't look quite so flowing tonight. Okay, Inspector, take over. I'm arresting all three of you on the charge of murder. Murder? What? Before you take them away, I want to show them this. Yeah, kiddies, here's a bag of pearls. I had them on me all the time. Mike. Yeah, here's what you killed old man Peters for. No, Mike. Shut up. You and all that corny talk about friendship. The three old buddies sitting in the sun. Yeah, blood brothers until one of them found a bag of pearls. Then it was his blood. Don't you say that. Oh, I'm not through, baby. I'm just full of surprises. Like they say in the minstrel show, honey, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here's what you killed old man Peters for. A million dollars worth of pearls. Mr. Forrester. Yes, Mr. Shane? Tell them what these pearls are really worth. Five year piece. They're not worth five dollars. You hear that? That's what you shot the old man in the back for, a bag of phonies. And here's where the phonies are going, right where poor old Peter should have thrown them in the first place. Right into the stove. Right into the fire. Oh, don't be the scene. Hey, Forrester, what's wrong? The fire will destroy them. You stupid fool, I've got to save them. Hey, hey, get away from the stove. I've got to save them. You'll burn. A million dollars. Ah! In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Someone finally pulled Forrester's arm out of the fire. While we waited for an ambulance, Forrester blubbered out the whole story. How he'd killed Peters for the pearls. How he'd come into the hallway of my hotel that night and would have killed me for them. How he'd have killed a thousand times for such wonders as those priceless jewels. Now I'd destroyed them. I didn't hear much of it. I just flopped down, let my head fall on my chest. All that had happened was finally catching up with me. And then as the inspector started up the gangway, I waved for him to come over. What is it, Shane? Here, Inspector. Give these to the museum or something. The pearls? Yeah, I don't understand. Well, the way Forrester acted when we picked him up tonight got me to wondering. I thought, why take a chance? So all I threw into the fire was the cloth bag. Shane, you know there are times when I almost wish you'd joined the force. Yeah. With all my other troubles, that's all I'd need. Okay, kid. See you around, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Mike? Uh, hmm? Feeling better? Yeah, I feel beautiful. You thought we killed Mr. Peters for the pearls. Mm. We thought you killed him for him. We love the old man so much, that's why we tried to kill you. You know, Eve, you can be arrested for that if I want to press charges, that is. Do you want to? Oh. At least it wasn't all wasted. At least I met you, Mike. Yeah, they yeah, big deal. Well, I'd better be going. I'm pretty beat. Must you go, Mike? Mm-hmm. Of 
fooled I am. This time morning, cut right through you. And if I stay, what would you do to keep me warm? I'll make you a nice pot of coffee. Yeah. Good night, kid. This is your director, Bill Russo. Michael Shane is written by Larry Marcus and based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, Mike Shane, against his will, gets involved in an exciting story of romance and intrigue. I hope you'll be listening. Thank <laughs> you.